Boom, boom, boom. And we're live. Yes. Um, hello, everybody on YouTube. Um, my name is Ben Dunn, and today I'm joined by my good friend and coworker, Mitch Rollick, um, who is uh, an expert in the field of climatology. Um, and today we're going to be talking to you about climatology as it pertains to permaculture design in particular. Um, we'll be here for about an hour, maybe up to an hour and a half. And I'm going to ask Mitch a series of questions from the perspective of a beginner mind, someone who's interested in permaculture, getting started with permaculture, um, but doesn't know much about uh, climate, weather systems, and how to think about those as they are uh, actually designing their properties or gardens or choosing to site certain elements or not. Um, so, Mitch, I'll kick it over to you to say a few words about yourself and, and maybe start us off with what is climatology? Uh, sure. Hello, everybody. My name is Mitch, and I am... Uh, I don't really know my job title at Birch. Um, previously known as a or an environmental technologist, but I think I'm just the resident nerd now. And um, <clears throat> so yeah, I uh, I initially became interested in permaculture several years ago when I was doing my undergrad at the University of Victoria, where I studied physical geography with a concentration in earth systems, and um, I was a lot of talking about problems that we face as a society as a species on this beautiful planet but not too much about solutions um and then out of my degree i couldn't really find a job uh other than mowing lawns or cleaning toilets and i really uh didn't want to be doing that so i uh Figured I would challenge myself more and uh, go pursue a master's in applied meteorology. And so I ended up in Dunedin, New Zealand, and studied frost, of all things. And I developed a statistical model that can predict frost in complex terrain with machine learning algorithms. And then taking a look at the meteorological controls on whether or what, what meteorological conditions led to a frost and which ones didn't. And um, so that, that's a little bit about my background. And then Ben, you asked what climatology is in, in general and in, in principle. And that's like a climate, a climatology of an area is, is generally a 30 year average of weather normals. Um, and then what I really like to do in the space of permaculture, because permaculture in essence is designing for extremes like so what are the most ex what's the most extreme cold what's the most extreme heat what's the driest that I could have what's the um, wettest conditions that I could possibly expect in this particular area so I've been looking more into that and um, yeah that's I guess that's that's where I'm coming in and then what I really like to do is uh, talk to people and give them tools and knowledge on how they may forecast this, essentially forecast their own weather, um, not relying on a weather network or something else. And to be able to recognize patterns in wind charts, to be like, oh, I'm going to probably get a lot of rain, mm -hmm. or it's going to be windy as heck, or wow, it's going to be a really nice weekend. Maybe I'm going to just plan already to be outside and not go anywhere. And I'm going to be in the garden all day. Yeah. Okay. So to, to bring this to the perspective of, of the average kind of gardener, the average human on earth, who's maybe thinking, you know, a day in advance, a week in advance, um, and who is maybe thinking in terms of the first frost of the season and the last frost of the season. Um, beyond that, I don't think the average person has much of a, a big picture understanding or context for, you know, climatology beyond day-to-day -day or average, average weather. Um, and so why do you think it's important to have an understanding of climate? And what are some of the pitfalls of, of not designing your property with climate in mind? Okay. Um, so in, in permaculture design or in 
a lot of regenerative agriculture spheres, there's a thing called the scale of permanence. And that starts with geography, climate, and then you know, water access structures. And geography and climate are sometimes interchangeable on which one's on top and which one's um, second. And essentially what that means is those are the things that you um, don't really have control over. You know, th that provides you with your context as to where you are. Um, and with geography and climate both in mind, I mean, you have to do an immense amount of work to be able to change your geography, your over, like the characteristics of the land outside your window. And whenever um, someone asks me like, well, what's geography? A lot of people think it's like, oh, like, you know, the capitals of all the places. And I most certainly don't. Um, I think it's being able to look out any window, whether that's, uh, you know, outside your bedroom window or office window, outside an airplane window, outside a submarine window, outside the window of a spaceship, and being able to appreciate um, the processes that build what you see. And I think that's, um, for me, what geography is. And <clears throat> having an understanding of where you are in that picture can help you design your place. And one of the pitfalls of not knowing um, is the wrong placement of things and then not reaping the benefits of actually having these things in mind. And that comes from like a broader synoptic scale. So like planetary weather systems all the way down to the micro scale. And the same things that dictate what's happening on a bigger scale are the same things that are essentially happening outside this window. Mm. There's obviously more going on in the background, but the same fundamental principles are still there. And having an understanding of those fundamental principles can lead to abundance or um, trying to put things in the wrong place that don't necessarily want to be there. Speaking of putting things in the wrong place that don't necessarily want to be there, um, I'm thinking about our industrial food system, you know, our, our current uh, large scale model of agriculture. Um, you know, we have taken uh, single crops like corn and we've planted them at scale and at giant monocrops way outside of their original cultural context, which is, you know, kind of Central America. Um, and so I'm curious, you know, what are, what are some examples of, of the problems um, that have arisen as a result of this, you know, this lack of a, a climate focused solution? And um, I, I think I'm just kind of re rephrasing the, the same question that I asked before, but with, with specific regard to our current food system. Um, well, I think with corn, it's more so like things need to be uh, hybridized and changed to actually fit their context. But that like, that's a whole nother can of worms just because of the biological implications. Of yeah. Having, like it just doesn't make sense in so many instances. And then, when, especially when it's just used for animal feed in feedlots, it makes even less sense. Mm -hmm. um, so I think like when, I, when you say conventional food systems and things that don't necessarily want to be there, I, my mind goes more towards the transportation of produce from places like, for instance, avocados in the middle of winter in Alberta. Mm. Don't necessarily want to be here. Um, what does want to be here is the is, is livestock and yeah. things that go in root cellars. Yes, yes, very much so. Um, is it possible to? I just I have like a whole sheet of questions, or I just want to like rapid fire these off at you. Um, is it possible to change climate? on either a short or a long-term scale? And is it possible with permaculture to assist in that process? Because as, as we think about um, climate change and our human effect on the environment, we think about how we can either reverse that or change that, move it towards a more positive direction. Are there things that we can do to you know, tangibly shift climate? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've already, we've shifted the climate already just as it is. Um, and if you are worried about that, there are things that you can do. One of them being is um, taking control of your own supply chain. Like mm. it's, I think it's more so about 
um, not so much what you're doing, but what you're not doing. But by doing, by growing your own food, you're not having to drive to a grocery store to buy food that has been transported from who knows where under who knows what conditions. And you know you have at least some control of the nutrient profile of that. I mean, and if you're building your soil, it's only going to get better. Mm. And if you can feed your community with that, once you scale up, then all the better. Or your friends and family. And it's just like, it's those little, little things that can actually have a huge profound effect on society. And like, to change a regional climate, one of the best things you can do is plant a lot of trees. Because um, like what a lot of research is going to now is about the small water cycle and restoring these small scale water cycle things or systems rather. And what happens when, for instance, when you deforest an area is all of a sudden there is less rain because you're removing that mechanism from there. So by planting trees, and there's no way you can sort of restore these ancient rainforests that have been absolutely decimated, but to plant trees and induce more friction on wind speeds will lead to more rain just by, from a purely physics perspective, because the trees are, you know, evapotranspiration, they're giving off water into the sky. And then when you, slow down the wind, essentially what you're doing is compressing that, how do I, how do I describe this? If the hairs on my arms are trees and this is wind, as soon as I hit that, I'm gonna slow down and I'm actually gonna go up. And if the wind is a taller column than what is my fingers, you know what I mean? Um, it slows down and it actually has to go up because it's not going to go down into the surface of the earth because it's, it's solid. So it has to go up. And when it does so, it rises, it cools, condenses, and creates rain. Hmm. In the past, when you've given um, talks, lectures, interviews about uh, climate, you often get into some of the physics behind it, you know, things like um, albedo, uh, evaporation, condensation, radiation. Um, what, what are some of the most important principles that, uh, or, or concepts that people can think about to help them understand the way that you see climate and landscape? Um, probably albedo would be one of the main things because and for those who are watching who are unfamiliar with what albedo is, it's the uh, reflectivity of a material. So this, this blackboard has a low albedo because it's black. The light that comes into it is going to easily be transformed into, um, to be absorbed and released as thermal radiation. Whereas um, you can see those, basically useless pieces of paper on the wall right there um, are reflecting a lot of light, meaning that a lot of the light energy that's hitting it isn't actually getting transformed into thermal energy. Mm. And then you can leverage that principle to create microclimates or even just find microclimates around your area or plant um, different vegetables that like those conditions. I read last, maybe it was a couple of months ago, but supposedly tomatoes really like having diffuse lights being bounced back at them. And which is really awesome because I happened to plant a bunch of tomatoes right there in the hottest part of the house. And it has a um, high albedo surface. So a really reflective surface right behind it that gives it more diffuse radiation or diffuse light. Um, think of that as more like dampened, light so you can you can look at it and not be like oh it's blinding but it's, it's still a source of light when the sun is coming down here it's bouncing off of there and giving the tomatoes some light and they really like that yeah um, yeah all of what but, you're saying really really oh sorry no continue um i think like the question on like what different terms and how you can um which one is almost the most important to understand that they're all interchangeable because 
the concepts of radiation and convection and um, conduction and al albedo are all, they all have a dynamic interplay on, okay? So if I have a low albedo surface like that blackboard, what's happening is light is coming to that, it's turning into heat energy because of the characteristics of it being a low albedo or black. And then I can feel that heat as mm -hmm. radiation. Or if I go and touch it, then that heat's being conducted to my fingers. And if it was a big, huge um, mass of land, like uh, a, just a field that has has been, you know, fallowed, then that is a big patch of land that all of a sudden has a regional impact because any light that's hitting mm. that is it's causing convection because it hot air rises. Yeah, it's interesting too. When, when we think about soil health and soil biology in our current farming practices of, um, you know, leaving large swaths of soil um, barren for long periods of time, like that, that dark color of the soil is going to trap a lot of heat. It's going to make it such that the soil biology is going to have a hard time thriving. Whereas if you have that soil covered, whether it be by mulch or a cover crop, or just perennial species that are providing shade, you're going to have much healthier soil biology as a result of that. Yeah. Yeah. Especially like that mulch can get eaten by all the soil microbes or a cover crop can be put back in and you're, you're also putting carbon in the soil. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, what you were saying about um, Abido to me really spoke to the importance of understanding principles before specific practices, right? Because an understanding of albedo, like you were just saying, can be implied in any context, anywhere in the world. Yeah. You know, if, you live, if you live in a colder climate and you're trying to extend your growing season, for example, you could take something like a dark wall or some, some big drums full of water and put them on the north side of your tomato garden and then plant your, well, I guess you were saying tomatoes like diffuse light, but let's say there's, there's other plants that like you know heat and you, and you live in a generally colder climate. There, there are strategies that you can apply to extend your growing season using these principles, which I think is such, such a beautiful thing. And it's so cool. Yeah. And it's, it's fun, you know, it's just like, it's not, um, what am I trying to say? It's, it's an experiment. Like you, when you turn your garden into a science experiment, it's, it becomes more fun and it has more room, I think, to um, ponder upon what's actually happening around you. Mm. Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. Um, what are some other questions I have for you? Oh, how can the average person learn to start reading the landscape to to notice microclimates, for example, on their property? Um, let's start with just around the house. Mm. Uh, I think that one of the biggest um, or most useful insightful tools is dogs because um, even just this morning my it was it was pretty chilly here we had a frost and my dogs were hanging out where it's warm because naturally they're like oh well I don't want to be sitting in this frost pocket so I'm going to go where it's warm um, on a really hot day for example you can find your dog somewhere where it's going to be cooler and so that's the one thing, if you, if you aren't going outside and actively going around like, oh, well, what's, um, what does this feel like? And that's, that's exactly the next step you should take is you should go outside and walk slowly around your house and like notice the temperature differences and what you smell and what you feel, because that's going to give you the biggest um, in, like inclination on what microclimate actually exists there. Um, you can, and again, there's, principles that you can leverage to just do the guesswork basically I'm like okay I'm guessing that this place is going to be warmer than this place based off of these conditions maybe it has a lower albedo so it's um, taking all that sunlight and re-radiating re -radiating it as heat and mm -hmm. we combine that with being a southwest facing wall because as the day progresses and the ambient air temperature increases and then the sun shifts to actually be pointing on a surface um, during that ambient air temperature maximum, you can expect that the 
area is going to be actually much warmer relative to elsewhere. Mm. Um, and that generally happens on the west side facing slopes or west side facing wall of a house. Um, conversely, like a north facing wall, because the shade from your house is mitigate or basically prohibiting any sunlight from getting there, you can expect it to be a little bit cooler. Um, and that's not totally a useless place to, um, it's not a useless place. Like on the north side of our um, house right here, it used to just be very overgrown brush and there was very little utility to it. So we converted it into a mushroom garden with an area to hang out. Um, I can try to find a photo of that for later if, if there's interest. Yeah. I love that. Just like a, a classic needs and yields, you know, like your house. Um, one of the yields of a house is shade on the north side. And one of the needs of, of mushroom gardens is, is a cool, shady spot to thrive. And it's like, yeah. if you can find ways to match up the needs and yields of various, you know, elements in your system, there's endless opportunity. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And having a good understanding of the physics principles that go into that, like, make it a little bit easier, at least in my mind. I mean, that's how my mm -hmm. mind is here. Um, and that's really what I talk about a lot in the microclimate part of the permaculture design course. Um, to build on the concept of microclimates in past presentations, you've identified three uh, base principles for microclimates. And I have them listed here. I want to, I want to, Say them to you and see if you could go into them in, in a little bit of detail. If you feel if you feel equipped to, to do so right now, um, yes, uh, throw it at me. The first one uh, that you identified of three is cold air is more dense than warm. That is, warmer air masses can hold more water vapor than colder air masses. Curious, curious you know about that. Cold air is more dense than warm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Warm air masses can hold more water vapor than colder air masses. And then the subtext for that was relative humidity is a function of temperature. Okay. Um, I'm, trying, so I'm yeah. trying to distill like the intelligence of your physics-based brain down to my, my non-physics-based understanding of the world. So I think the, the first thing that you talked about there, cold air being denser than warm air, is mostly a concern for frosts. Mm. Um, air like water is a fluid and weather is essentially this the stirring of a pot a very very big pot that goes around the sun very fast and is also spinning so it's quite a crazy stir of the pot um, but sometimes that's the way you know what I'm just going to bring something up here because that makes it a lot easier to actually communicate what the heck I'm talking about. I was liking that analogy. I was getting it. But visually, it helps. <laughs> <laughs> Something here to see. And so this is today. This is this morning. And I know from looking this morning that down here in New Zealand, there's probably some prime conditions for a frost. And so when you stir the pot, and when I say you, I mean um, just the action of spinning around the sun really fast and then rotating as well. There are differential, there's differential heating. And as I was saying, hot air rises and the opposite is true, cold air sinks. It's gotta go from one place to another. The earth is always trying to reach a state of thermal equilibrium. And that's essentially what the weather is. And there are a couple key patterns, and I know this is a little bit of a tangent off of what your initial question was, but relevant nonetheless. There are two main patterns that if you're interested in this, you're gonna to wanna to focus on. And there's a third that if you have time to, I'll get into. But the two patterns are, and this is a good picture right here because they're right beside each other, is this, this is a high pressure system, is the first pattern, and that is that air is flowing away from a central point. And the second pattern is that air is flowing towards a central point. 
And it doesn't matter like where you are on the planet. It, and I was thinking about this last week that it actually comes down to scale, time, placement, and form. Mm-hmm. And I mean, that, that principle in and of itself is cropping up in many, many places. Um, but the scale is um, how big that differential is between the pressure between here and here. And when I say pressure, what I essentially mean is um, pressure is analogous to the height of the atmosphere above you. And so if there's, if it's really tall, then you can expect that there's going to be more pressure. By really tall, do you mean like there's no clouds in the sky? It's a perfectly clear day? That is a detail that arises out of this particular pattern, but not necessarily um, because of it. Because um, in high pressure systems, and this will also help understand the idea of high pressure versus low pressure, air is actually descending from above. So you can imagine like, okay, that the air is coming down. So it's, it's, it's heavier. So it's mm-hmm. taller and it's coming down. So it's, you feel like, oh, there's more pressure on me today because the air is literally coming down on top of me. Hmm. The, the column of the atmosphere, so to say, is also taller. And so what happens there is, as you said, there are no clouds in the sky. The implications of that being that um, thermal radiation that has accumulated during the day can easily just escape out into space because there's no clouds to bounce it back. Essentially, clouds are effectively blankets at night. And I'm sure if you're watching this and you have gone outside and there are no um, clouds in the sky and it's very clear, you can see the stars, you can see the moon, maybe even the Northern Lights or uh, Australia or, or, or what's it? <laughs> um, the Southern Lights, then it, it's a lot chillier. And that now that that said, we can get to what you just said, and that cold air is more dense than warm air and will, will essentially flow downhill and go, it will mm. pool in areas, and that's what causes the frost. Wow. So you can, so like, you can really visualize that, like the air like fluid moving across the topography of a landscape. Yeah, and you can get thermal imaging cameras and actually see it, see it happening. I mean, not that's incredible. uh, I I know that exists because I've read papers that have done it, but I don't think too many people will have access to those thermal imaging cameras. But (laughs) it would be um, if you're interested in mapping out frost pockets, then that's one super high tech way to do it. There are other ways, and that's just purely observation and just going outside. I'm like, oh, where are there? Where is there frost? Where isn't there frost? Why would this frost accumulate here relative to up there? And by and large, there's a couple of principles that you can use to just even guess where a frost pocket might be. Mm-hmm. Um, and in observing what I've been able to after like coming into the space and realizing the importance of frost and growing, it generally tends to accumulate in areas that are really flat or that are hollows because, you know, as if cold air is like a fluid, it will flow into these hollows and it'll stay there. And if it's really flat, then it won't have anywhere to actually spill over to, so to say, in the same way that water would spill over. And then Mm -hmm. if that cold air is just hanging out there, then as I was saying before, like the world is always trying to reach a state of thermal equilibrium. So is everywhere else. So everything wants to be the same temperature. So when there's cold air hanging out over top of your garden, if you happen to be in a really flat area or a hollow, then the, the, the plants will essentially radiate to radiate out more if the air temperature is cold enough. And then that will cause freezing in the plant cells. Hmm. I've never really, I, I've, I've listened to a lot of your talks about 
uh, climate in the past, but have never really visualized air like a fluid in the way that I do right now in my brain and also seeing it on um, Earth at Knoll School there in front of me. And, and, and something else that you often talk about and that's that's discussed in permaculture quite often is the concept of uh, various energy flows. And that permaculture design is essentially working with the flows of energy that interact with your property to, to varying degrees of scale. So for example, sun and radiation, you know, that is an element that intersects your property that you have the opportunity to engage with and leverage, uh, utilize, avoid, whatever you want to do. Um, mm -hmm. Wind, for example, that's a force that you, you can't really control. You just have to design with it. It's going to come from a direction and you have to, you have to deal with it. Water, precipitation from the sky, like ground flow. Um, and then our role as designers is to work with the nuances of the site that we have to accomplish our, our goals, essentially, as designers. And so, um, yeah, it, it just made me think of that, like there, there, that air literally is a fluid, like it's actually flowing across your property that way. Yeah. And if you were to, I mean, if the troposphere, which is the area in um, the atmosphere that actually basically dictates our weather. That's where the weather happens. And that varies in height depending on where you are. And you could like those low pressure systems and those high pressure systems, if you could see the, the boundary of the troposphere around the planet, you would see this undulating mass mm. of blob of air with swirls all around inside of it. And that, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a very dynamic fluid and it's very thin and fragile. Yeah. Yeah. And speaking of, of fragile, it's, it's hard to prescribe like really easy plug and play solutions within permaculture. I know that whenever people come through our permaculture design courses, they're looking for just things that they can go and, and implement right away. It's like, oh, I've just learned about swales. I'm ready to, to toss in some swales in my place and plant some trees. But you really have to take that time to observe and, and interact with the land, like you were saying, Mitch. A lot of it is experimentation and, and time spent uh, in your environment, just seeing what is there, really getting to know the land um, and what will work and, and what won't work. Mm -hmm. um, and just on that note, um, you had earlier talked about the that first principle, like cold air is denser than warm air. Yes. And then a little bit on relative humidity. Yeah. Um, so think of, um, and that's just like, you can use this as to your advantage for passive irrigation. And this ha does happen in places. Um, so during those high pressure systems, when that cold air is sinking, um, it will often, or it can condense because Cold air, um, how, okay, how do, I, how do I say this? Um, when you see clouds in the sky, it, that is a detail that signifies that in that area, that the temperature is just cold enough that that particular spot in the air can no longer hold the water vapor inside of it and it condenses out. Hmm. So it has, it hits its dew point is what it's called. And so relative humidity is, um, if you've looked around what happens in the world, um, you know, deserts tend to be like incredibly dry. They might have a relative humidity of, I don't know, somewhere between 10 and 25%. And that means that that air in that area is only holding 10% of the air possible. So there is a, there's a dynamic interplay between the amount of moisture and the temperature. So if the amount of moisture mm -hmm. were to increase in that desert area, then the relative humidity might or would increase. But in the same vein, if 
we go, we take that back to the original 10, 15% relative humidity and drop the temperature, then the relative humidity would go up because it cannot hold as much water. And you'll notice like when it's raining, you have a relative humidity of about 100. And here is actually a good, so this is from my weather station that I have just outside the door. Um, which shows the diurnal temperature changes. And we're gonna go back and actually, no, that's too far. Notice a general trend as the, the gap between this red line, which is the dew point, and the blue line up here is that tend to be mid afternoon where the temperature is the highest, which also happens to be, um, I don't have this weather station situated appropriately to be very representative of what happens around the property because it is in a microclimate. But the closer that these are together, the higher the relative humidity will be. And so if I go, let's say to, this is October 9th at 6 a.m. I'm gonna go here, go to relative humidity. October 9th, 6 a.m., we had a relative humidity of 93%. And then it drops again. That is the middle of the afternoon where it gets to be the most hot. And therefore, the water can hold, or the air rather, can hold more water vapor because it's hotter out. And so it would take an incredible amount of moisture to get that up to 100% where it would be raining. It'd be very mucky. It wouldn't be very pleasant. So messaging Jen in the background here, asking if there's any questions from, from the audience for you after this. That's all good. Um, and, whoa, that's what I was getting to, is you can use that principle of getting down to, you basically want to engineer a system whereby when there is that cold air drainage, it will actually get so cold that it can condense on things. And again, the concept of edge is really important here because the more edge there is around something, the more radiation or more, um, I don't say ability, but the, there's more uh, thermal energy escaping. Like if I were to go like this out in the wind, I would have more thermal energy being whisked away from me than if I was, you know, curl, curled up into a ball. And that that's edge right there. Mm -hmm. um, so there have been places that have engineered this to have passive irrigation with that in mind. And that these are um, cinder cones. This is a vineyard on a volcano. I forget the name of where it actually is, but this will passively irrigate um, a vineyard, wow. which is so cool. Through through condensation and frost. Yeah. Not not so much through frost because it's in an area that is um, pretty warm. Mm. But I'm sure that there are some frosts and there would be some risks associated with having your crop in a hollow like that. Because if you had a very still, very still night and there was no wind to actually stir the pot, so to say, and get the air moving around, then there could be a risk of frost. But yeah, this is a passive irrigation technique. That's so cool. What is what are some other examples of, of mind boggling, uh, you know, microclimate design features that you've seen? I know you have a couple that you typically bring up when you do these presentations. Um, the, now it's not like one hundred percent confirmed on whether or not the moray terraces were actually um, an agricultural lab, so to say, but there is a lot of evidence to suggest. Um, that they were. And for anyone who is watching and doesn't know what they are, what the Moray Terraces are, they are in Peru and they're, I think it's 25 miles northwest of Cusco. And this is just a photo of them, but there's a tremendous amount of, like we've done pollen analysis in this area and have found a tremendous amount of different pollen grains, which can suggest that this was actually an area for hybridization of plants. And given that so much of our contemporary food crop actually came from mm. this area, 
um, especially potatoes, then like that, that's incredible. That is really incredible. And it's, it's, a, it's a, an extremely extreme environment. Like this is very alpine. I think it's 3000 meters above sea level. And um, the temperature difference between down here and up here is I think 15 degrees or it can be. Um, and that is because when you think about it and you have all of this, like this is characteristically, I would call low albedo surfaces. And so you have all of that, I can't see my, let's see, can I get a laser pointer on here? <laughs> um, can you see my mouse cursor already? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I'm not sure which way is north facing here or south facing. Um, I can look it up in Google Earth Pro, but this is essentially a, a lot of low albedo surface. And when the sun angle is hitting this, you're accumulating quite a bit of heat right here. So it'd be quite warm down here. It's, it would take a lot of wind energy to, to stir the pot in this area, so to say, to get to have a thermal equilibrium in that area. So there's different microclimates in here. So you plant one thing in one area. If it does well, cool, great. That, that let's take that to where characteristically that, that microclimate exists on a broader regional scale. And then you kind of find the thresholds for that. Maybe it's something that you really actually want to be able to grow in different places. Well, let's challenge it. Let's get that. Let's only pick the ones that survive and do well and then hybridize them with their children and just keep that train going along until you basically created the conditions or you've changed the genetic um, requirements for that plant to thrive. And... Mm. That is, that. yeah, that is, that is really crazy because, I mean, I, I've seen exa some examples of this obviously being exposed to a lot of permaculture designers over the last couple of years, but mo most people will look at their growing zone, for example, you know, whether they're in zone three or, or zone seven, um, they, they look at the plants that they can grow there and, and most people probably wouldn't look very much further but then a permaculture designer is, is here thinking, okay, well, you know, on average, you know, this is kind of the coldest and the warmest that it gets, but how can I leverage microclimates? How can I le leverage the specific nuances of my site and use, you know, topography and slope and aspect and different sun angles to, you know, maximize what I can grow in this area? Like I've heard you and Rob talking about growing uh, coffee in in Canada, for example, I don't know how much you've been thinking about that over the last few months. But how could you apply the principles of how how could you leverage microclimates to actually grow coffee in Canada? Like some some initial ideas to make something like that possible. It would it would essentially be what I was talking about with the Moray terraces. Like you would have to one find a plant that was or a coffee tree that was cold hardy enough to actually have a chance and then i mean you this would take generations and word on word on the street is that mark shepherd is also working on this oh okay at least from his bypp recordings his his summit talk it was um he was like i'm not allowed to talk about that <laughs> um but in principle, I would imagine what you'd have to do is first, and this would this would be an expensive project to undertake because it, that is seriously trying to force function mm -hmm. something that doesn't want to be here to be here. And it would take generations and very careful um, controls on that. So how I would imagine this actually working is doing a hybridization approach where you find a coffee tree that is cold hardy right now and then placing it in a greenhouse or at least maybe not so extreme as a greenhouse, but giving it the conditions where it can just like barely survive. And then even just as a, and you'd have to bite so many of them, by the way, too, just because uh, different things happen, diseases, frost, maybe it just doesn't like the soil, this, that, and the yeah. other thing. Um, 
Um, but you'd have to buy a lot of trees, put them in a controlled environment, and then basically every generation try to make them tougher, like by exposing them to more cold and like do it very gradually. I imagine is how it would work. I haven't done such an experiment, so I don't know, but I have um, thought at times of just like doing a mini miniature scale more terraces here. That'd be wild. That'd that be would so be, cool. be very wild. Well, when uh, when you set up the GoFundMe to make it happen, let us know. We'll, yeah, we'll, we'll do. throw it up on YouTube to collect some donation. <laughs> That's yeah. That'll be that'll be a while. Yeah. It's, it's a dream project, not so much. I'd have to, I want to go to the Mora Terraces as well. Actually, you know, there's a, um, if anyone's watching and they're interested, I found this book on the Mora Terraces and some, um, some studies on the engineering of it. And it's really interesting, even just from a um, water drainage perspective, because it's been engineered in a way so that it never drains, or I mean, it never floods, it always drains. Um, hmm and set up and different gravel placements so that it doesn't flood, which is wow. insane because it's just a big giant hollow on in a mountain. Yeah. Um, and I'll, I'll try to find that. But well, yeah, while, while you're looking at that, I just wanted to say, you know, while, while some of the physics and the principles behind this can seem complex, you, already have an understanding of microclimates whether you are aware of it or not when you go out to have a coffee in the morning where do you want to sit you know probably that's somewhere a little bit sunny and maybe you've recognized that that sun typically hits this one spot in your backyard at a certain time of the day and then over the course of the season season as the sun angle changes that sunny spot in your backyard changes and so Mm -hmm. You're already a permaculture designer. You're already a microclimate designer. Now you just have to start looking at other elements. I, I think it really co- just comes down to, like you're totally right. It's, it's, it, it, there is an instinctual basis. You're like, okay, I want to go somewhere that's comfortable. Um, but especially when you're moving from one area to another, like I was saying before, like make sure you, uh, internalize that feeling that that shift in mm. perception when you when you turn the corner around here and I, I remember uh, it really hit me this summer when it was like 34 degrees out here and I turned the corner right here like oh my goodness this is just so much more pleasant I want to wow. hang out so let's build a picnic table and let's hang out here because it's, it's good refuge in in the summer are you pulling something up there? I am. I just put this in the in the in a Dropbox. I, don't, I can put a Dropbox link in the chat um, for this Incan engineering. Oh, okay. cool! Yeah, yeah. Nice. Well, while you're doing that, we have a question from the crowd from Matthias W. Okay, Who's asking. So when the temperature dependence of relative humidity makes it rain less when the atmosphere heats up, what causes heavier rainfalls then that are said to come due to climate change? Okay. Um, So I was talking about a third pattern um, when I was talking about these ones right here. And one of the other patterns, a very important pattern, is convergence, where these air masses are coming together, where we have high pressure here flowing to a lower pressure area right here. And so you imagine when, what happens when water collides and there's no way for it to go but down, I mean up. It can't go down. It's on a planar surface and it comes together and it goes up. So when that same thing happens with air and there's no way, nowhere for it to go but up, when there is a lot of force driving that, you get 
and so there are other nuances in it, but atmospheric rivers are essentially these long rivers where areas are converging together and literally shuttling insane amounts of water towards land. I can't remember mm -hmm. when the, um, when were those floods in Vancouver? Was that in January this year or in, in Abbotsford? Oh, um, gosh, when was that? Yeah, I'm not sure. November, 2021. Okay, so let's go here. Um, and I'm gonna put this in the YouTube chat as well, just because it is handy for people to be able to explore this on their own. Okay, so November, um, I was just saying January, no, it's June. When was Abbotsford flooded? November, 2021. Okay, well, that's a big month, but we'll be able to figure it out. Uh, so I'm just going to calendar here, November, 2021, okay. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, there we go. That's right here, I'm guessing. Hmm. And even if it, this isn't the date, then um, there would have been Whoa. quite a bit of rain at this point. And so what's happening here is we have um, all of this air. We have a, we have a more or less a low pressure system over here that is sucking up an insane amount of air from both of these high pressure systems right here. And when they get sandwiched together, there's a lot of uplift and it's all going towards one focal point, essentially that, that low pressure system. And it's carrying literally the equivalent of the Mississippi River in the sky. And then when that hits land and it causes it to you know, cool and condense and go up, it just pours down. And so we can it's go mind boggling. Through different um, layers, either total column water here or total precipitable water. And it paints, I mean, it literally looks like a river. Yeah. Water just flowing. And so you have a lot of moist uh, air coming from the subtropicals right here with tropicals. And that is just getting sucked up and getting just, just pummeling the west coast of Canada. Hmm. And I don't think that answered the initial question. Can you repeat that one again? I know it was a uh, relative humidity and um, temperature. So when the temperature dependence of relative humidity makes it rain less when the atmosphere heats up, what causes the heavier rainfalls then that are said to come due to climate change? Uh, more, I mean, that is, it might be getting warmer, but there's also more evaporation. So areas that are traditionally quite rainy, quite wet, will likely get more wet. Areas that are traditionally dry, will likely get drier. And then there can be instances where it's like, okay, sometimes we have a rainstorm, like in Las Vegas recently, it's traditionally a very dry place, got absolutely flooded. There's more water in the atmosphere because of more evaporation. And, that, and then we can just go down this huge rabbit hole of rainwater harvesting and how important that is because yes. that's a whole nother talk though. Yeah, hopefully we can get, we can do that again. Uh, I do a rainwater talk soon. Um, right now though, I'm just looking down at my clock and it's been almost an hour and we've covered a lot of ground in, in this conversation and hasn't had as much, much of a, a thread of continuity <laughs> as, a, as it might've hoped. We've kind of been all over the place with it. But if any of this has, um, piqued your interest if you're interested in learning more about climate, microclimate, climates, how to design with them. Uh, Mitch is one of the lead instructors in our upcoming permaculture design course, where he spends, I think it's a full two weeks on, um, maybe it's just one week, I'm not sure, Mitch, maybe you can clarify. I've got um, three classes on climate and then one on mapping. Uh, okay. Mapping one is new, I'm gonna meet, that's my first, it's my first year teaching that one. 
Um, and then I'll be talking about synoptic climatology, which is these big, big weather patterns, how to identify different patterns in them and what they mean to you. And a general overview of global climatology, like why, why do these particular patterns persist in this mm -hmm. particular area? And then uh, the second one is all on regional climates. Um, so the broader scale geography, those landscapes, the implications, or, or even being close to the ocean or larger bodies of water, what the implications of that is to your design um, and your property and what you might expect out of weather. And then microclimate. So things, um, yeah, like what we were just talking about earlier about how to leverage these different areas around your house or out in the garden and like what might be affecting those, how to create microclimates, um, the, the principles for passive soil greenhouses and root cellars and um, yeah. Great. Yeah, so if, if any of that piques your interest, um, we will put a link down to the permaculture design course um, landing page in the course in the description of this YouTube video so you can click that and learn more. Um, and we hope to see more of you guys in the future. We're gonna do three more of these intro to permaculture videos over the next couple of weeks. So stay tuned. Have fun. Ben, do you have any more questions or is that, was that it? Um, I, that, I asked most of, of my questions. I had some, you know, perhaps some specific questions about how to leverage microclimates with regard to, you know, more specific elements like soil structures, um, animals, landscape effects, but I don't know how much, how much time we have for that today. Well, I mean, it's up to you. I'm all yeah. yours. Okay. Um, Jen, what do you think? You're in the background there. Yeah, we can keep going for 10, 15 minutes. Sure. Sounds good. Oh, I just did a whole little wrap up there and we're going to keep going. That's okay. It's your lucky <laughs> day for, any, for anybody listening. <laughs> um, what is another question that I had? Yeah, I want to talk about how we can leverage uh, microclimate specifically for season extension. Um, strategies that you are aware of that you can re recommend for people, um, you know, perhaps some, some low tech strategies. Yeah, you bet. Um, it's gonna pull this up here. I wanna swap displays. Um, what I have found, and I will say, like, um, this is my first year gardening, like, or seriously gardening, other than just potatoes and onions. <laughs> um, which basically, form the basis of my diet. Um, and playing around with these concepts, especially just like, okay, where's the hotter places? Where are the colder places? That has been invaluable. And this is what we've, um, this was our, this is our hot microclimate. So for season extension, this is, this is it. And like, I can look outside. I don't even know if the camera will get over there, but not really. Um, there are still tomatoes on the vine. There hasn't been a frost over here, but there has been a frost everywhere else. Hmm. So to have uh, those systems set up, so you can see in this photo, there's um, concrete back here, gravel. Here's that higher albedo surface, more thermal mass over here. And so that is really keeping this area. It's still cranking. I mean, I can still go out there and get peppers and it's the middle of October. There's still tomatoes and they're still vine ripening. Um, and it's, that's a very low tech, um, solution for that. But other than that, you know, group houses, cold frames, those are relatively simple carpentry builds that you can add or just build in other places. Um, you can either add them onto your garden or just have different raised beds. Um, and so I would involve, like, you can get so cheap and thrifty with this. It's insane. Like Dean Sofer, the guy who built the Arcopia greenhouse in south side of Saskatoon, he got old school bus windows and then created his, like the bottom at the knee wall, um, his windows there are all old school bus windows. Mm -hmm. And so you can be really nifty 
with these things. I wouldn't, I generally wouldn't recommend um, having any sort of glass that's oriented towards the sky for hail reasons, but um, like poly or um, even if you can get like not even the, the polycarbonate, the poly plastic sheets, if you make it really tight, you can create microclimates and um, like the basic principle there is to increase the amount of solar radiation getting into that and decreasing the amount of thermal radiation leaving that contained system. And that can be a very effective way to extend your season. I haven't done that yet. There's been a lot of things to do, but it's on the list. Yeah, I, th I think that's really neat though, you know, beyond, um, you know, kind of structures and, and strategies that you apply, even just the the mere location, like the placement of your garden in different aspects of places in your landscape can extend your growing season. The fact that all you did was plant the garden on, I think it was the west side of your house versus any other spot, you were getting a longer season because of that alone. Yeah. Um, and then it's it, what, not even on the shoulder part of the season, but during the, that heat extreme in the middle of summer, um, I wouldn't, I, you couldn't put lettuce there or spinach. It would it would both in no time and it would not be good. So you need to match those microclimates to what actually can withstand those, um, those conditions. And then I'm going to put a tool in the chat that I really use a lot. Um, and so that's in the chat now, Sun Surveyor. It's just an augmented reality app where you can go and track or put your phone in the sky, okay, nice. the sun is likely to be in this spot at this time of year. So you can go to June 21st for summer solstice, and then either September 21st or March 21st for the equinoxes, and then December 21st for the where your sun angle is going to be lower. That's, of course, going to be opposite if you are in the southern hemisphere for the solstices, like where the sun will be highest or lowest. But it's been a really invaluable tool to be able to map out where my potential microclimates will be. That's great. Yeah. And beyond this personal application too, if you're looking at doing permaculture design as a profession, to do a microclimate analysis for someone is a huge value add for your design process. Like if you can use that tool and do a sun analysis of the different places in people's property, you know, that just unlocks so much potential. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or you'd be like, oh, well, this area is not going to actually get sun until May. Maybe mm -hmm. I don't want to plant here. Yeah. We have another question from the crowd for you. Okay. Um, Mitch said land masses makes the air loose, lose its water. Mitch oh. said land masses make the air lose its water. How come? Is it due to the decreased evaporation compared to the ocean? Maybe I didn't understand that correctly or some or missed something. Um, I likely didn't explain it all that well. Um, just because we were in a big flurry. So let's go. I'm going to just get something ready here. Do, 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 do. Okay. Okay, so here is the west coast of Canada. Here's some mountains and land masses in general. And so what happens when you have, and this is an area of persistent westerly winds. So there will be a fair bit of evaporation over here. So it's, it's fairly safe to say that when the westerlies come, they're moisture laden and they have already a pretty high relative humidity. And so when that air mass or the wind blows that air towards land, what's going to happen is it's going to hit that land and it has to go up. And when it goes up, it cools and then it'll hit that, hit that dew point where it goes, oh, I literally cannot hold this water in me anymore. I must let it go as rain. And um, that's essentially what I meant by it. land masses cause air to lose their water mm, yeah okay what other questions do i have for you here mm. 
I am interested in, um, so we've talked about microclimates with regard to, you know, season extension, frost prevention. Um, I'm curious now to talk about wind uh, a little bit more, specifically with regard to um, shelter belts. Um, so shelter belts, for anybody who doesn't know, are um, meant to provide shelter from debilitating wind, from really strong wind that could damage your, your structures, could damage your plants. Um, they could take the form of earth mounds, fences, hedgerows. And so I'm wondering if you could provide some comments on the, the pros and cons of shelter belts with regard to a property design. Because I know um, a lot of industrial farmers prefer not to have shelter belts because of the reduced space for crop production, yet there are a number of benefits that they do yield. Absolutely. So not only do they um, just increase the biodiversity on your property, which is has myriad potentials, I mean, and benefits, you know, you're increasing more um, birds, bugs, bees, you know what I'm talking about. All the bees. And um, you're providing shelter for animals. So there have been studies, and most of this is from what I understand is from New Zealand, um, or at least what I read, but livestock weights are are lower in areas where they don't have shelter belts because they're stressed out. They don't go out and eat. Wow. And I, I think this, this just comes down to a, a good principle of, of, again, Dakota is like, if you're going to have a farm, but you like, you should want to put yourself in any of those, um, they don't have shoes, but you would want to be a worm, a cow, a sheep, donkey, anything you would happily trade places with. And like happy animals are going to taste better. They're going to um, have more fun. And I think in turn, that will give a more enriched life. But, and there are, there are different ways to, to stagger them. An important thing to consider too, is you don't want to have your uh, shelter belts as structures that will totally impede wind flow. They need to, there needs to be some wind that gets through them because if you just build an obstruction to the wind and you have a big gust and it hits essentially what you are creating is a wall where it can actually get through, and then you're creating conditions that it will rise up and create little eddies in the background that are often more violent um, and intense than having not put up a windbreak. Mm -hmm. So you want to have some ability to, you want to allow the wind to actually slow down. And, and the key here is actually, it's again, edge, uh, because you want the trees to have enough edge where they're actually slowing down the wind by friction rather than just creating this wall where it has to hit and then go up that when you create the wall there's less edge yeah yeah i asked that question kind of kind of knowing that we could spend a full hour almost alone talking about shelter belts but uh, if people are interested in learning more about shelter belts in consideration of time um there is a great uh i think it's a pdf document from the government of alberta mm -hmm. that they share and bill mollison does a really good job uh discussing hedgerows and shelter belts in the permaculture design manual if anybody does want to learn more yeah and then you just need to know what, where your winds are coming from and you can do that through there's various data sources and i'll talk about that in the in the pdc as well on how you can get those data sources and um and use them and then you can orient your shelter belts in the right place cool i think it's going to be a great permaculture design course this year i'm really pumped for it yeah i'm fun it's gonna be my third year teaching that one i think uh having more tangible experience in another year of observation and like what is actually important when I look at these maps and I look at what needs to get done or yeah, what yeah. um because before I was I was just renting I was in a basement suite and I like the theory was was there and I knew what was important but I didn't have that sort of intimate relationship that I is, is required so yeah. I'm, I'm really excited for this year it's gonna be fun cool do you have any closing words about climate and designing with climate before we end off? 
Um, not so much. Just uh, be be curious um, with everything. I mean, that comes from when you're cooking food, like the pattern that you get when you're stirring the pot. It's the same pattern that goes turns the weather essentially. Um, it's just the mechanism on how that turning actually happens is a little bit different, but those patterns are essentially universal in scale and to uh, understand them and to incorporate them into your design and find the risks and benefits associated with those patterns is, um, I know will, is incredibly handy and beneficial. And so pay attention yeah. more, like just when you're, when you're looking around like, okay, what, what do these clouds mean? Um, or I know and this from the work that you did too, and that you presented on, um, the, the level of observation is, mm -hmm. um, is heightened after a permaculture design course. Yes. And I think that for me, it's, um, I mean, in my undergrad and master's, this is what I was trained to observe. And so now to be able to apply that to permaculture design is, is awesome. And those, it's not incredible. It's not rocket science. The weather isn't rocket science as much as it might seem like it is. Yeah. Yeah. Permaculture at its core is about, is about pattern recognition, uh, understanding patterns found in nature and being able to mimic those patterns, understand them to apply within our own systems and then to design based on principles that that make sense and instead of um just you know plugging and and playing with uh things that maybe work somewhere else you know you have to understand what's going on on your site before you can actually take any action and yeah a permaculture design course we're finding um does measurably change people's outlook. Um, they are more observant of the natural world around them. They, they notice more of the little things that, that Mitch is, is seeing with his site that maybe the average person doesn't right now, just kind of unlocks that. In addition, it gives you a whole other suite of useful skills. So I'd highly consider jumping into a course. If anyone's watching and they're, they're interested, and just uh, feel free to send me an email as well. If you want to chat weather anytime, I'm super happy to do so and um, have fun. We'll see you in the future. Nice.